Hey, 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 everybody. I'm Mark Shipper from Fifth Down College Football, 5D CFB, Fifth Down CFB on X, IG, TikTok, YouTube. Uh, please follow the accounts, like, subscribe, tell your friends, tell your family. Uh, today, I'm excited. I'm joined by a, a champion in his own right, a man of many talents, writer, boxing enthusiast, college football enthusiast, podcaster with Jason Whitlock on Fearless. And his name is Steve Kim. So, Steve, welcome. And uh, how would you describe yourself? Well, I'm, I'm a media member uh, by trade. I cover boxing. I also do a show with Mario Lopez. Yes, that one from Saved by the Bells called the Three Knockdown Rule. Uh, but for the most part, I'm known for my boxing coverage for the past, what, 25 years of my life. And then I also am a regular contributor with Jason Whitlock on his Fearless program. And I would call myself a diehard Miami Hurricane fan. So I've always said that um, I cover boxing professionally. I follow college football as a passion. Yeah, it's an easy game to get passionate about. And you're a Miami guy from way back. When did your Miami fandom get going? It's, it's interesting. Uh, it really happened in the mid-80s. As a child of the 80s, I grew up in Montebello, California. I had really been kind of more of a Pac-10 UCLA type of guy. But the, the mid-80s, specifically when Jimmy Johnson got to the Miami Hurricanes and, and, and some of their antics, and I think it really – where I, I started to kind of be – really intrigued by that whole program is uh, the coin toss against Oklahoma, the 86 game of the century, one versus two, you know, and when they really became notorious is when they came off the plane in army fatigues and you had the steak fry with Jerome Brown. I, I thought they were the most entertaining band of renegades and they played this very, very fun, unique style. And I love Michael Irvin. Michael Irvin to this day is still one of my favorite athletes and characters. And from that point on, really, you know, back then, as good as they were, they were nationally televised a lot, mostly on CBS. And there are some iconic comebacks, 87 Florida State's probably the game that really forever sealed my fanhood of the Hurricanes. And from that point on, that's really where it began, my passion for the U. And I can't remember, Steve, were you involved with the U doc at all, the Billy Corbin two-part doc? No, I really was not. I actually know one of the producers, Alfred Spellman. He had actually been one of my readers when I was covering boxing. He's a boxing fan, and he had tipped me off to it. I, I've actually helped uh, in indirect ways. There's, there's been a couple of books about Miami, specifically the Miami-Notre Dame rivalry. I had done some interviews with some ex-players for Kane's time. I spoke to a lot of guys that played, some guys who made the NFL, other guys who didn't, and I helped that particular writer get in touch with some of the players. He used some of my stories. And, you know, I've actually written a pretty good amount of stuff about the Miami Hurricanes uh, for various websites. Kane's Insight, I'm very close with the owner, Danny Money. And I do some other things. And I never get paid for those things. Those things really are about sharpening your tools as a writer. Yeah. And it's really a passion product project to kind of get your name out there. So I feel like anything in life that you do, you have to do it consistently to stay sharp and get better. As I like to say about boxing, activity matters. And, you know, then I'll jump on some spaces here and there. And now I'm here with you, Mark, talking about Miami, Florida. Yeah, yeah, no question about it regarding the practice and writing, especially that's that's my background. I come from a newspaper background, and um, I'm writing a book about college football. That's what this whole fifth down college football is about. And there's no question about it. I Hemingway wrote in his collection of short stories he talked about the difference between living and writing. And he said, you have to live to have the material to write. But when you write, you got to get back at, at the desk and sharpen the knives and yeah. you got to put the blade to the whetstone and you got to get it sharp again. So that's, that's um, kind of universal wisdom, something you do a lot. You're going to get better at uh, provided you're practicing in the right fashion. Of course. Yeah. There's never been anything in life that if you care about, and it's a good endeavor that you get better at by doing it less. That yeah. is universal to any trade, any hobby, any job, any vocation uh, that you do. And, and I've had great fun. It's been very beneficial to do these stories throughout the years because I've gotten to know a lot of those players I grew up watching. And some of them I actually consider friends now. I still keep in touch with them. I see them at games. We call each other. We text each other. Uh, and they give you some incredible insight. Uh, over what took place that sometimes not even put in books. They're not put in documentaries. I mean, I'll, I'll just give an example. Claude Jones, who's now a doctor, 
He has three national title rings, played from 1987 to 1991. So in five years there, he has three national titles. And some of the stories he tells about the recruiting visit he got from Jimmy Johnson, uh, the transition to Erickson, and some of the insights he gives on the games. And I, I see Claude a couple times a year when he travels out for conferences. We'll have dinner, and then we went to a couple games last year. So even though I don't get paid financially, I think the benefits for me – um, have really been worth it on a personal level. Yeah, no question about it. And um, it's interesting the time frame that you picked up your Miami Hurricanes fandom because you were there right at the end of the series we're going to talk about, which is Florida Miami, and and it is it's an extremely interesting series. What what I think a lot of even probably pretty serious college football fans don't know is that this was the original rivalry in the state of Florida. And it was the big rivalry. These schools started playing in 1938 um, in their regular series. Florida State didn't become co-ed until after World War II, 1946. They didn't really start playing Miami until 51. They didn't play uh, the Gators until 58. And Florida Miami was the state championship game. It was so big, in fact, that they played from 55 on through 87 when the series stopped, they played for something called the Seminole War Canoe, which is a full-size canoe crafted out of a cypress tree that was struck by lightning. The Seminole Indians in the state didn't want to let the good wood go to waste. They crafted a canoe. They said it symbolized the fighting spirit of the state, of the rivalry between the two schools, and they donated it to the schools, and Miami and Florida played for it for 38 seasons, and the rivalry was so tight when that war canoe went away in 87, when the series stopped, it was 19 to 19. Both It, it, it ended in a dead heat. So um, for you, do you have memories of, of this rivalry in the 80s just before it went away? Yeah, I actually do. You know, the 87 game is really funny. It's Emmett Smith's first game as a Florida Gator. And that game was a nationally televised game by TBS, believe it or not. And it ended up, ended up being 31 to 4. Miami had this long snapper. His name was Willis Pagese. He eh, kind of a small for a long snapper. He's a defensive end. Actually played for the Oilers a little bit. And so the, the Miami fans, their headline was Miami 31, Florida nothing, Willis Pagese 4. And a young Emmett Smith out of Escambia, Pensacola, got a couple of carries late. And there was a lot of, um, I would say, animosity between the two sides. Miami wanted to keep on playing. They're at a very high ebb. You have to remember – that was three years before Spurrier. They, they were kind of declining, and Miami was ascending. And I remember the famous sports columnist, the voice of Miami sports for years, Edwin Pope, basically said they dumped Miami to play Montana. <laughs> and for years, Miami wanted this series to go on, and it, it would always really anger us Miami fans. Even a kid like me on L.A., when Steve Spurrier – in the early 90s would say stuff like, well, now nah, I got to tell you, you know, I tell Dennis, you get to play San Diego State. Well, I got to go to the SEC. And Miami fans would always shoot back. Well, wait a minute. We never wanted to cancel the series, you know. And, and right. I remember, so we play them in uh, 87. And it was actually a very big deal when we played them in 2000 in the Sugar Bowl. Miami had an outside chance for the national title. And it got very heated. There was a fight on Bourbon Street between the two players. That ends up being Butch Davis's last game. I mean, Mark, I was there in 2003 with that amazing comeback led by Brock Berlin. Right. And you could really feel like, wow, these games really mean even more now. Because they play each other about every five, six years. 2013, we played them at Hard Rock. We kind of grinded out this tough victory after they had beaten us in 2008 with Tim Tebow. Uh, Manny Diaz's first game was in Orlando at Camping World Stadium. I was at that game. I thought Miami blew that one. And, and now we're here. But Miami-Florida was always a game you figured in-state rivalry with the ramifications at stake. You would think that game would be protected. But they used the excuse of, well, we're in the SEC to begin with. And, Mark, it turns out it's a foreshadowing of what's to come. Because in the last decade, we have not seen Texas and Texas A&M play each other because of conference affiliations. Right. Yeah. Um, uh, a lot of the ground you covered there is is um, gets at the heart of what this is. This 
it was a huge game. And there were a lot of kind of incredible quotes uttered by luminaries at the time that game was canceled. And as they were ostensibly trying to get it rescheduled, um, some of these are great. I have a few written down. Howard Schnellenberger kind of encapsulated it when he said, every one of those games was the biggest game on our schedule. Every one of those games was a time when the whole campus came alive, but they think adding Miami made the schedule too tough. I guess it's going to take an act of God and the hard work of Floridians. It may have to come from the legislature, but something has to be done. That was Schnellenberger on Miami's side on Florida's side. Exactly what you said. The sec went to first, it went to seven games. Then it went to eight games. Florida wanted, I think six home games and it left two non-conference. They had Florida State in a home-and-home home already, and they did not want to – they said either Miami plays in Florida every season or we're going to cancel the rivalry. Now, <laughs> the, the thing from Florida's side about that is Florida State kind of put the, the lie to that claim because Florida State played Florida and Miami every year, and most years it was out of conference until uh, Miami joined the ACC. So, so Florida could have done it, but, um, but Mark, let me just say this, there is a dynamic. And if you talk to anyone that's in Florida and I have a lot of friends, um, that are hurricane fans, they went to the school, they will tell you that, that Florida state and Miami fans have a grudging respect. They don't really hate each other all that much. Even when the rivalry between 1987 and 1994 was the most impactful rivalry, uh, in college football. Right. It gave you, you win that game, you have an inside track at possibly winning the national title. For Miami fans, there were two great rivalries of that era. It was that in Notre Dame. Florida State fans, I think, feel the same way about Miami. Both Florida State and Miami fans absolutely detest Florida. There is a particular hatred that exists. Um, it's almost like we respect them for at least putting us on the schedule. You know, and then Bobby Bowden was a really, I, I thought he was a folksy old guy, great for college football. There was a certain Southern charm to that man. Right. And him, him and Schnellenberger actually used to do photo shoots together, posing as boxers with boxing gloves, almost in like an Ollie Frazier pose to promote the game because both programs, quite frankly, needed the help. Florida has always kind of been more or less, in our view, the arrogant school uh, up in Gainesville. And, you know, I, I, it's funny about Florida is that there used to be a joke that they had the arrogance of Alabama with the tradition of Vanderbilt, something to that effect. <laughs> and I, I think it, it really, the decision they made, I thought really robbed what could have been an unbelievable series of games against those great Miami teams and Steve Spurrier. I think those games would have been incredible. You know, Spurrier from day one in 1990 had Florida going very well. Uh, Miami still had most of the Jimmy Johnson players coached by Dennis Erickson. But, you know, basically now, you know, and, I, and I'm going to give Florida a little bit of a break. They're not the first and only team to cancel a series against Miami during that notorious year. Maryland, after they scored a late touchdown, they said Miami's not good sports. They canceled the game. Uh, Notre Dame flat out said we're not going up to Miami anymore. It got too violent and vicious. San Diego State, Mark, now this was a disappointing thing for me because I went to every game we played at Jack Murphy, Murphy Stadium. Every year there seemed to be a big brawl. They had a 16-year series. They canceled it after four years. They said, it's, it's, we're just best moving on. So <laughs> that, the thing about Florida is interesting, though. You know, for years outside of playing Syracuse in the early 90s, they never played a non-conference game outside of Florida or outside the SEC read, they would not travel. And that's the one thing I've liked about Florida State. Florida State and Miami, if you look at their non-conference history the last 30 years, they've actually played a lot of good schools from the East Coast, West Coast, and everything in between. Florida really has not. Yeah, absolutely. I was actually just kind of looking for this. Bobby Bowden had the greatest quote uh, ever about the Miami-Florida State series exactly what you're you're talking about right now bobby bond said as good as we were we didn't win a national championship until 1993 mainly because we kept losing to miami on missed kicks i used to get mad because nobody else would play miami notre dame would play them then drop them florida dropped them yeah. penn state dropped them we would play miami and lose by one point on a missed field goal and it would knock us out of a national championship 
I didn't want to play him either, but I had to play them. That's why I said when I die, they'll say at least he played Miami. You know, Mark, the greatest, most honest quote about that came from Barry Switzer, who flat out said, I think it was after the 86 or maybe even the 88 Orange Bowl. He says, unless I have to play Miami in a bowl game, I will never schedule them again. I think one of the greatest stats ever related to Miami football and how good they were in that era. In 85, 86, and 87, Oklahoma was 33-0 against the rest of the country. They were 0-3 against Miami. Right. Successive years. Yeah, that's that's how good Miami was. They were they were the terror of college football. Um, yeah, that's college football's dirty little open secret at this point, I guess. But it, it started way back at the beginning of the sport, actually, with the Ivy Leagues, Harvard, Princeton, Yale where they would schedule one or two big games a year. The rest of their season would be a run-up so they could enter the rivalry games against each other with an undefeated record, essentially. And that scheduling model has come down through the decades in college football. A big part of the reason for that is, of course, because the mythical national titles and popularity contests and a 12-0 and record looks beautiful or an 11-0 record when they played 11 games. And many teams would schedule to generate those records. So if you go back over the history of college football and look at all the, the mythical national champions, which is what they were called when they were voted on AP coaches poll, you will be able to pick out several undefeated teams, maybe even one loss teams that probably weren't better than other one loss and maybe even two loss teams who played a much more difficult schedule. Miami was an example of that for a while. Florida state wasn't it. That's what made Florida state's run from 87 to 2001, yeah. essentially the 14 straight top three finishes. So incredible is Florida State played four or five difficult games every year and a major bowl game. So uh, Florida State and Miami were similar like that. Re regarding Florida, because I want to be fair to Florida, I, I love the state of Florida and the big three. And um, I wish that would have been a round robin uh, state championship during its heyday. Um, Spurrier had an interesting quote on the series. He, he said, we can only hate or despise so many teams. Um, and what he was referring to is, is the Florida Gator fans hate and despise Florida State. They hate and despise Georgia. They hate and despise Tennessee. So if you added Miami to that mix every year or kept Miami in that mix every year, Spurrier's point was kind of, you know, we're loaded up on, on hated rivals and we kind of have to do what's best for us. But, you know, your point about not leaving the state after losing to Syracuse in 1990, that, that's part of the Florida Gators football story. It is. And, you know, back then, you know, Miami fully entered the Big East, I think, in 92. They were part of the Big East in 91. And if you look at their schedules in the 80s when they were fully independent, and our athletic director was a guy by the name of Sam Jankovic, still the best athletic director I think a football program could ever ask for. There were years where Miami would play like five or six really good teams. There was one year in 88, this was Jimmy's last year. They played preseason number one, Florida State. They played the eventual Big Ten champions, Michigan. They played the Southwest champions, Arkansas. They played a bowl team in BYU. They lost by one point to the eventual national champions, Michigan. And there was one other game that I missed. Oh, they played LSU at Death Valley, who was the co-SEC champions. So, I mean, and then, then there were other years, quite frankly, they only played about two, three good teams because they, they, they had to mix it in East Carolina, a Cincinnati, uh, there was a San Jose State, there was some San Diego State, and I'll be honest with you, Mark, I always joke about it on Twitter, but I'm only halfway joking. I kind of miss the independent days of Miami, being this renegade program that would play anywhere, anywhere, anytime, and, and when they were building the program, uh, you talk about the clauses that are put in, they would actually tell teams, we'll give you two home games to R1. And in fact, they played Michigan twice in the 80s at the big house. Michigan never came to the Orange Bowl. So those are the deals that you had to make as an upstart program back in the 80s. Yeah, yeah, they are. You have to offer concessions because these teams get locked into their league schedules. And it's so hard to beat your own league every year that when you go out of conference, you maybe want to test yourself once, maybe twice at the most. And then you need a couple of off weeks. But I, I actually think as we head into this super era as college football is reorganizing, those days are largely going to be over. I'm, I'm not sure what that'll mean for the FCS 1AA schools 
And I'm not sure what that will mean for the G5 schools in terms of getting their paydays for playing the, the big dogs. But I, I do think going forward, you're going to see these uh, loaded up schedules like Florida has this year, for example. Florida has maybe the most brutal schedule in, in college football history upcoming. Well, Mark, you talked about how records can be deceiving. And, you know, Bill Parcells is famous for saying you are what your record are. That, that's only true in the National Football League. In college football, there is a variable. It is a schedule and also the margin of victory. That will really tell you who you are. And this is going to be a test for the committee because I think all of us, whether we are an AP or a UPI voter of the past or any type of pundit, we had a natural inclination to always shove up the undefeated or one loss teams up into the top 10 or of our top 25, right? I think nowadays you really have to go through and examine some of these two, three lost teams and who they lost to and when and where in the margin of victory. Because you're right. I get the sense in a 12-team playoff, if you're specifically in the two bullies, which is the Big Ten and, and SEC, trust me, I get the sense there's going to be some three lost teams in those conferences. And unfortunately for everyone else, you might get one mulligan. And you know what? Based on who they have played within that league, it may not be all that unfair, to be honest with you. Yeah. No, I don't think it will be. And that's that's been – for me, in my travels and discussions, it's actually a chief complaint that comes up frequently, which is regarding scheduling and home schedules. Um, a, a lot of fans are upset because with television, with commercials, with the stadiums expanding and the traffic in infrastructure around stadiums remaining the same, uh, the commitment on a college football Saturday is enormous. You want to go to a game, you, you, you block out seven hours of your day. Mark, it's not three and a half hours. It's not four and a half hours. It's six and a half or seven and a half hours. And if you have a weak home schedule or a bad non-conference schedule and fans are paying full prices and, and putting all this time in, they want to see better competition. Now add to that this, this playoff and the at-large selection process of it after we get through the top five, and you're going to probably need a pretty strong schedule to get in. So there are going to be some trade-offs with the playoffs, but my hope is that that will become a benefit and improvement to college football. It is, and look, as someone who is a traditionalist who – I, I actually would not mind a 16-team playoff as long as we still had the Southwest Conference and the Pac-10 as we know it. I, I don't like this whole AFC-NFC format that we're going to. Yeah. I, I really don't. I, I, I think part of the charm and the appeal of college football to me is that every conference, it was really proud of what region they were in. They had a personality. They had traditions. They had built-in rivalries. And then if you would have brought them all in together where teams were not being annexed and conferences being basically extinguished, I would actually wouldn't be so opposed to it. But at the same time, I look at some of the weekends like October 12th, Mark. I know you've seen the graphics on Twitter. That is a loaded, loaded lineup that day. Yeah, I, that's an unbelievable list of games headlined by what Oregon against Ohio State. And there's like five other games at that caliber. So part of me is saying when I see Michigan and Texas playing, and I think that may have already been scheduled before. But every week, Mark, there's at least three games where you're like, OK, that that's a big one. It wasn't really like that before. I mean, there yeah. would be a couple of weeks a year. You're like, OK, Miami's playing Long Beach State, which, by the way, they did. By the way. <laughs> <laughs> And every other game was just kind of a eh. every week. Now there is something significant and it has ramifications. And in terms of the expanded playoffs, look, I, I used to be a big baseball fan, played it my whole life. I, I, I would say at one time I was pretty avid about my fandom. I remember the uproar when they expanded the playoffs with the wild card and they went to the realignment. A lot of people thought it ruined the sanctity of the regular season. You know what, Mark, to be fair, and to be fair to Bud Selig, it actually didn't do that. It has actually made more games relevant for more teams going into September. So I want to see how this season plays out before I call for the ruinization of college football. Yeah, 
I agree. Um, I, I, I have forecast for quite a while that uh, I, I was a traditionalist to myself, by the way. And I still say, I say it regularly on Twitter, if I had my druthers, if I had my choice, I would wind the clock back to just before the BCS hit in 1998. Classic traditional college football, 11 game regular season, bowl game. You could add the conference championship if you wanted. The SEC started in 92. Add the conference championship, make it a 13 game schedule if you want. But then the mythical national title at the end of the season, we play the bowl games January 1. We can play a, a, a national title game January 2 if we need to, or, or, if, the game, or if the day falls on a Sunday. Um, take a vote, name a champion, move on to the next season. For people who didn't get to experience that, that traditional college football, that's what you're talking about when you're talking about the 11-game gauntlet where every game is, is do or die. Yeah. Um, no mulligans. Every once in a while you get a one loss champion, but but generally it was going to be an undefeated team and a loss was devastating. That was the best era of college football. But if we can't wind back to that, I actually think the BCS and the CFP were just half measures that really damaged other aspects of the sport. And they should have just gone to this playoff right away. Well, Mark, think about last year's SEC title game. Under this current format, it's just about seeding. Georgia and Alabama, it wouldn't have mattered who won. Right. I mean, if I'm Georgia, not enough is made about Georgia being the presumptive number one team for 13 weeks. They lose a close game to Alabama, and they go from number one to out of the playoffs. Right. And they actually had a healthy team. It's not like Florida State that lost their quarterback. They still had Carson Beck and a lot of NFL guys. And that was the beauty of it. I still remember the Miami's 1990 team. I think it's still the better team than 91 that went undefeated. Claude Jones has told me, go, Steve, out of the three national title rings I have, I always think I should have had a fourth because he lost to Ty Detmer in the opener at BYU. One of the most stunning losses in Miami history. I, th I think he won the Heisman that day, week one. <laughs> and then we lost the final game of the Notre Dame rivalry, which still haunts all of us. And that was in middle of October, Mark. And we had two losses. And I knew it. It was over. It was right. over. Like, you you fall. You are the flying Walenda, and the wind blew you off, and splat. It's over. No no safety net. Right. Now, now it's just like, hey, long as we don't have three losses, we can make the – It's and, and I'm going to tell you, it's not as fun. It is not as fun because when you were a team that was really good, you kept thinking to yourself – we can't have a bad. Now you can have two or three bad weeks, Mark. That is the reality. Yeah, it's it's going to be a little different. Like like I said before, there there is a trade off to this playoff, but to me, I am so acclimated to the new world. We we saw a two loss champion during the BCS era. We had multiple oh, for, seven, for, for for every two thousand five Texas USC game, and we got a couple of those, and that was the BCS working at its its absolute best. We had we had several controversial champions. We had several controversial selections. We actually split a national title in the BCS era, which is the yep. one thing it was created to prevent. Well, Mark, which is, is funny as it gets. So yeah, go ahead. In nineteen ninety and ninety one, we had back to back split titles. Yeah. In 90, it was Georgia Tech, the Cinderella team led by Sean Jones and coached by Bobby Ross. Right. Um, and the other team, who was the other? Oh, Colorado, which was Colorado. Logan. They went 10-1-1. and one. They actually had a tie, too. And then in 91, it was Washington and Miami, who were by far the two best teams. I don't think anyone else was in their class. And, and you're right. The thing that gets me is you talk about the loss of traditions. And, look, I enjoyed week zero because, obviously, Georgia Tech beat FSU and everyone rejoiced. But, I mean, you talk about the loss of traditions. I, I actually went to a couple of the Disneyland classics at Anaheim Stadium. I, I, I remember the first year they had it. It was Colorado against Tennessee. They played a tie. It was a great game. But I went to when Florida State was the number one team in the country. I wanted to do some advanced scouting like Connor Stallions. I saw them blow out <laughs> BYU. Um, when John Robinson came back as to the SC coach for the second time, I went to the game where – a young Mac Brown, they absolutely pounded USC at Anaheim. Uh, I, when Miami played Ohio State in the 99 kickoff classic in New Jersey, yeah. had a great time. I used to love those games. I thought it was much better than week zero because you had that Thursday night, and it just felt big, like, okay, this is the kickoff, right? And then here's another thing that I hate, Mark, and I know you agree with me. 
can we get some good Thursday night games back again? I know. The NFL ruined that. I look at the Thursday night schedule now. It used to be the unofficial start of weekends for guys like you and me. Yes, it did. It, it really felt like, okay, we're ready. We're ready. Oh, yeah, and now absolutely. You're looking at tier games that I remember I was working at an RPS factory, which was low budget UPS loading boxes in 1991. That Miami-Houston game, when they had David Klingler and, and the John Jenkins run and shoot against Miami, and the teams were like John at each other, uh, that felt like a Super Bowl. It's the slowest day of my life because I started loading boxes at like six o'clock. It was, it was like a right. kind of a part-time job, and the the seconds seemed to go in minutes, and the minutes seemed like hours. And for about 35, 40 years, Mark, that is still one of the highest rated college football games in ESPN history. We don't get those games anymore. Of that yeah, count. you're totally right. You're totally right about Thursday night. What One thing, I bump into people all the time who think the NFL invented Thursday night football. They have no, they have no memory that that was a creation of the colleges. And they used to play a great game on Thursday night. I remember it was 95, I believe, Florida State. Suffered its first ever ACC UVA, loss to the Barber Brothers. Yeah, to the Barber Brothers at the University of Virginia in Charlottesville. Warwick Dunn comes up a yard short at the end of the game. UVA wins. It was it was Florida State's first loss in the ACC since they joined the league in '92. But that's indicative of the kind of games we got Thursday nights. I remember coming home from football practice and being able just being so excited to flip on and watch a great college football game on a Thursday. Perfect amuse bouche teaser for the weekend, and uh, I, I, you're absolutely right. I agree with you. We need to get good games back. We got a couple. This is going to run after tonight, but we're recording Thursday. We we got a couple good ones tonight. At least yeah. interesting games. Yeah, they are. And Mark, remember during the Thursday night ESPN games when it's at its peak, they used to have the halftime, the whip around, and they'd go to like Ivan Mizell would give like a thirty second report. Then they'd go to Tony Barnhart, and, and then whoever was like the beat reporters, and you felt like okay. I'm ready for Saturday. And, and this is the thing. I, I am not a fan, per se. Look, the Friday night college games, I will be watching Oklahoma, Temple, I believe. I want to see Jackson Arnold. I, there's some other games I'll watch. But, again, Friday night should be for high school football. I don't know. I, I think you're infringing on a great American tradition. But once the NFL – started taking over Thursdays, it was only natural that college, they're going to take over Fridays. I, I find it to be an unfortunate domino effect. Yeah, I, I do too. I actually wish the leagues would get together and make some agreements. Uh, they used to have a pretty, it was informal, but it was, it was, it was like a handshake deal about they, they when each, it. about when each league was going to play. And um, they've really, they've let that go by the wayside and they need to fix it. They need to make it right. Because there, there really is, there is enough time to go around. I get what these schools want to do. As many of them want to get on by themselves, as many of the conferences want to get on by themselves as they can. But um, a, a little bit of separation of the leagues would be great. The organization feels better. It just feels like a cleaner system rather than this sort of greedy battle over every time slot on every day. Mark, I'm such a hypocrite. Uh, Friday, September 27th, I'll be at Hard Rock. We play Virginia Tech. <laughs> I had nothing to do with that schedule. <laughs> yeah. Well, here's the thing. Everybody's still going to watch and they're going to go. That's the problem. It actually does ruin stuff because when you put the games on, people are going to go. So it that's why it actually screws stuff up. You may not like it, but if your team is playing or it's a game you want to see, you'll be there or you'll be watching. I only get 12. And the bottom line is if Miami gets out of Gainesville alive, there's a very good chance they could be 5-0. And if you tech, if you look at Vatech's schedule, they could be four and zero because I think they have an Old Dominion and they have some, they have some in Vanderbilt. They have some very winnable games going into that week. Mark, I want to ask you something. As a UCLA graduate, is there a part of you that wants UCLA and SC just to get slaughtered in the Big Ten as punishment? Because I, 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 as a West Coast native who's lived in LA my whole life, I still consider the Pac-10 a part of me because it's. My whole life, I've known about the Pac-10. If you would have told me 20 years ago, Steve, there will be no Pac-10 and UCLA and SC would be in the Big Ten, I would have given you a million to one odds. Yeah, it's the most insane move that's ever been made in college football. But USC and UCLA would not have made it had it not been 
necessary at that point. The the Pac-12 presidents and their Svengali commissioner, Larry Scott, Larry had Scott. really destroyed their, their marketability. Um, the decline of West Coast football over the last about 12 years has been as shocking and disheartening a thing as I've ever watched in college sports. I We're at the point now where it's been long enough that I'm explaining to people how prominent and how important the, the PCC and the Pac-12, Pac-10, Pac-12 conference has been to the history of college athletics, the Rose Bowl domination, the All-Americans, the Heisman winners, the professional players, and all the traditions out there. The, the you know, the UCLA USC game is, is a monster event out there. And, and at this point, you got people thinking they don't even care that the schools play football anymore, which is untrue. So, to answer your question, no, I don't want to see them slaughtered, but I am angry at that league, at the chancellors and presidents, at Larry yeah. Scott for allowing what they allowed. And, and it was really them allowing it to happen, yeah. of, of trying to serve two masters, of trying to be an Ivy League-like academic yeah. collection and a major football uh, collective. And as we have seen over and over through the history of college football, you have to go all in on college football if you want to be great. Yes. You have to say this means something to our university, and I am willing to accept the headaches and the disruptions it may cause for the benefits it brings to the school. And the Pac-12 made uh, Einstein's definition of insanity, doing the same things over and over and expecting a different result. They tried the old playbook. And it failed and it blew up in their faces again. And now the 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 domino effect, the term used earlier on college football, has been immense. They don't belong in the Big Ten, but at the same time, I understand why they felt they had to yeah. do it. Mark, it's funny. As one of the five people in L.A. that actually had the Pac-12 network, <laughs> I'm not kidding. I literally, you don't know how many SC and UCLA graduates and friends of mine that are just like satellite alumni, like I am with Miami, who could never actually get the network. For some reason, Spectrum had every single like affiliate because they were they were regionalized the Pac-12. They had a Bay Area Pac-12, Northwest Arizona, and I would watch a lot of their documentaries, a lot of their classic games. They'd have like all-time Pac-12 best 12 quarterbacks. I'd watch those religiously. They did a good job on them. I'd watch Pac-12 after dark. When when it finally went off the air in mid-July because they had an announcement, and you'd go through the for me my cable box it was. Channels 382 to 400 were all the Pac-12s. So one day I just happened to see something that I wanted to watch on the guide. And I said, oh, UCLA SC 87. And it was a blank screen says, Spectrum is no longer carrying this network. It yeah. really felt it like symbolically dirt being laid on the gray. I was just kind of like, wow, it's real now. If yeah, I know. What, you had to take off, put your hand over your heart or salute or offer some kind of farewell. It, it, it was a disaster. It's so funny you mentioned all those regional networks. That was part of the Pac-12's issue. They tried to build their own television network rather than using existing infrastructure like the Big Ten and the SEC and ACC did. They spent a fortune. They made terrible mistakes. But the ironic thing about it is, is what you just mentioned is if you could get the Pac-12 network, Good. They actually did a great job with it. They had good production. They had good people. They had great historical context. It was a channel worth watching. It's just that nobody could watch it. Yeah. And, and by the way, last night, so anyway, I'm getting home and, you know, I work out of an office because I just want to be away from home. And I'll, I'll catch up to college football live, the CBS college football show. I think they're very good. I'll watch some other stuff. And so all of a sudden I'm going through the guide and I go, oh, UCLA classic football. What? And so, and it's the UCLA LSU game from three years ago when Charbonnet just tore up LSU. It was on the Big Ten network. And this is one of my pet peeves. I hate when they start putting in games of schools, some of their greatest victories from 30 years ago, when they're in a different conference. I don't know why that bothers me, but when I see a Miami victory from the 80s and it's in an ACC network, I'm like, no. No, oh, yeah. when I see Nebraska, when they blew out Florida in the in the 96 Fiesta Bowl, and it's on like the Big Ten network, I'm like, there should be a rule. You have yeah. to actually be in that conference at that time to actually be having classic games rerun on that network. It's always bothered me for some reason. Oh, no, 100 percent. It's a, you're right to have it bother you. It's it's sacrilege. It's like. It's like corporate raiders buying up some some history they want and then pretending it's theirs. Yeah, you'll turn on the Big Ten Network and it's like 
the 71 game of the century, Nebraska, Oklahoma. And it's like big 10 football. And it's like that game is imprinted so classically as a big eight matchup. Yes. That they have, they have no, but you know what, if they do show it, because I love it when they put the old games on, they should have a branding on a, a marker on the screen that says this was a big eight football yeah. game <laughs> rather than pretending that this somehow happened in your league. There's something foul about that. I, I'm in total agreement. Yeah, the, the, I got to tell you, I don't even think Stalin would like the rewriting history to that degree. Let's just yeah, leave it. It, it, absolutely. It's yeah, <laughs> it's more than even Stalin would like. I agree with you. Um, all right, circling back, so we we've, we've set the stage for this Miami at Florida <sighs> game. The, the great the great thing about this rivalry is all the intensity we're talking about. You know, in Gainesville in 1980, the Florida fans were launching frozen oranges. <laughs> Down at Miami, Howard Schnellenberger after the game said it was like incoming artillery on the sideline. Um, you mentioned the the Sugar Bowl at 2000. This rivalry instantly boils; it heats back up instantly. So it, it's it's not like it's. I went to Nebraska, Oklahoma in 2021. It was 50th anniversary of the game of the century, and it was a great setting. It was a fun game, but the rivalry was truly dead. It, it did not pack the heat that it should have packed, but Florida, Miami, the heat, it gets turned right back up. Well, Mark, going through the history in 83, when Miami made that miracle run, Florida skunked Miami in the opening game, 28, three, Bernie Kozar's first start. Right. Uh, and they were 0 and one. I don't think it was even possible nowadays or during the old BC. You lose your opening game by 25 points. You're out. Of, you're out of the national title race. Miami had like five things happen on new year's day to win. Then in 85, opening game that year, Miami lost to Florida 35-27. Miami wouldn't lose a home game for another decade. Yeah. That actually started. That was Vinny Testaverde's first start. So there's a lot of things that have happened here. And in this particular game, the coaches are under immense pressure. I think Billy Napier needs to deliver at least a 500 season, or he may not be the coach 12 months from now or even five months from now. For Mario Cristobal, I think the pressure is different, Mark. He has to deliver a big year or there's going to be start to become, I wouldn't say job security because I think that's really out of line. He's well too, he's way too well connected politically to have his job on the line. There's a lot of support for him in the upper reaches of people that really matter at UM. But he's got to deliver because there used to be a thing called a five-year rebuilding plan. Mark, in the age of the NIL and the transfer portal, it's basically a three-year window now, especially yeah. if you have an NIL package or a collective like Miami does, and you can recruit the way Mario does. I, I think Miami is poised to make a playoff run here, Mark. I really believe that. I've told other Miami fans, do not be afraid of high expectations. Mario has put together a really, really good-looking roster. Well, think about this for a minute, and and I want to hear your thoughts on this. My aunt, uh, Mario Cristobal is twelve and thirteen through two years in Miami, um, which which is not good. Not good. But last year, Miami was plus fifty three yards in ACC play. They had a good offense. They had a good defense. Now, somebody said this, and it really, <laughs> it really stuck with me. They said the sum of the parts does not add up. Does not does not add up at the University of Miami. The sum is not greater than the parts at Miami, and they said that to us appears to be a coaching issue. So, my Mario Cristobal, charismatic, well, excellent recruiter, excellent fundraiser. The kids love him. Look at the Georgia Tech game last year. Uh, that was one of the worst blown games in the history of college football. Take a knee and it's over. They run the football, fumble, lose on a hail mary. What do you think looking at Mario Cristobal and his staff is the issue there? Is this a coaching issue? Do they have the right guys this year? What's going on? Well, look, the, the Georgia Tech game is going to hover over his head like a dark cloud till he wins something significant. And I remember watching that game, and I actually tweeted the play before Don Chaney's fumble, which really wasn't a fumble, but it never should have been in his hands. I actually tweeted out, why are we not in victory formation? And formation in football. Right. And so it really, well, look, I was too young to really remember the Joe Pasarczyk game. Well, I, we have, we have our version of it. It happened last uh, August or October 5th or 6th, whatever that date was. Mark, here's the thing about Cristobal. 
I think it's like everything you listed is true. But last year's team was both top 35 offense and defense. Yeah. And in in a regular year where nothing freaky happens, that's a nine-win team. And I don't think there's any doubt there were some coaching decisions made that led it to be a seven-win team. The handling of Tyler Van Dyke after he got the yips, I was at the Clemson game last year. Mark, I'm not the coach here. I'm just a fan. I'll give an opinion. I was stunned when the very next game they pulled Emory Williams to bring Tyler Van Dyke back in. I would have stuck with Van Dyke as really the backup, and and I would have let this young freshman grow into the job because we almost lost to a bad Virginia team because Tyler Van Dyke threw three interceptions. Then we played North Carolina State in an absolute slobber knocker we set offense back 50 years. We could have won that game. Quarterback threw three interceptions. That stretch right there, that decision to go back to TBD, I think cost us at least two games. And Mark, this is just my opinion. With what Miami was paying him with the NIL, I think a business decision was made. I think that there was some acute pressure to get our money's worth with Van Dyke, and it cost us. But let me defend Mario, though, because I think he'll he'll even tell you I should have done a better job. And I'm a big Mario Cristobal supporter. Here's a guy that took over Oregon at a very low ebb. It wasn't going well with Coach uh, Herflich, right? Who was it? Heflich. Who was yeah, they had Mark Heflich, but then they had um, Willie Taggart came in. And Willie Taggart. Yeah. Um, but Mario got them to a Rose Bowl. He had a double-digit win season he actually went to two Rose Bowl one of them was a shortened season he also went in in 2021 and beat a loaded Ohio State team at the horseshoe without his two best defensive players Kayvon Thibodeau and Justin Flo I remember watching that game thinking wow he did a hell of a job and he did it with Anthony Brown who wasn't exactly let's put this way he wasn't Joey Harrington or Justin Herbert with all due respect so this whole notion that Mario can't coach that he's the rich co-tight of South Florida. I push back on it, but I do think he needs to evolve because Mark, we get one year of Cam Ward. Cam Ward is a modern day spread shotgun quarterback. I actually believe we need to be a little bit more pass heavy in terms of run pass ratio and go back to 2019. Did anyone ever think Ed Orgeron would be a wide open coach that would let Joe Brady run an offense, score 50 points a game, have to have that ability to evolve. Yeah, it, it's an interesting comparison. Jump to the other side, Billy Napier. Uh, you're not a Florida guy like you're a Miami guy, but you're a college football uh, connoisseur. When you look at Billy, he's been called too nice. He doesn't have enough of an edge for the University of Florida. What do you see at Florida with Billy Napier? Yeah, so as it relates to Billy Napier, the thing that, that kind of I think of is like, I wonder if they realize how good they had it with Dan Mullen for all his flaws. Look, Dan was not exactly the the hardest working grinder on the recruiting trail but when it came to modern offensive day football and play calling he was top notch and i i wonder did they fall for the whole well he's associated with nick saban you know because there seems to be like this mystique that hey who's the next kirby smart and the issue that i think florida has right now is that georgia is at the greatest ebb that they've ever had um alabama is alabama Tennessee is now serious about football again. Ole Miss is, is back, probably the best roster they've had in 50-some-odd years. The SEC, to begin with, is really, really good. And I've seen this happen with Miami. When you fall behind in any way, whether it's the arms races in terms of facilities or recruiting or you hit a couple of bad seasons, it's actually very tough to bail yourself back out. And unfortunately for Billy Napier, he has an absolute gauntlet of a schedule. There's about nine really good teams. He, he does Even his bye weeks are probably tough. And the issue that he's going to have is, and I know Graham Mertz, Mertz was really good last year. If they start off, let's say, one and three, one and four, at what point do they go to DJ Lagway? Because you are talking about a coach who may not actually get a chance to rebuild this if, things, if this thing goes sideways by early October. Yeah, it's, uh, those are all fair points. I interesting with, with Mullen. Mullen, there are some parallels with Chip Kelly at UCLA <laughs> in, terms of, in terms of the ability to coach offense 
and good connections in the sport, probably a network that could bring in good assistant coaches. Chip had hired DeAnton Lynn, who USC bought away from UCLA, but Chip did not recruit and Chip did not run the program like a coach in this era needs to run it as a high operation, high energy CEO. Chip just wanted to call plays and, and coach some ball down at practice and on the sidelines during games. And UCLA had to move on from him and, and they were going to move on if Chip had not left. It was uh, a foul up in the athletic department that that had caused Chip not to be gone already. So that relationship had been poisoned, which is why Chip was poachable by Ohio State as an offensive coordinator. Mullen is a little bit of a similar case in that Florida sees the players these top schools at the SEC are getting and know that at Georgia, at Alabama, at Tennessee, these guys are going to hunt the best high school players in the country um, with every with every tool in their kit. And they saw Dan Mullen being not willing to do that, even kind of disparaging it publicly is like, yeah. get off my back about recruiting. We'll get who we get. We'll be fine here. I know how to call plays. So I, I understand why Florida felt they needed a sense of urgency in the building. And I understand why they picked Napier. They thought Napier, as you're saying, as a Saban disciple, the next Kirby Smart, they thought Napier, because of what he did at Louisiana, had a big vision, like Schnellenberger had when he came to Miami, like Bowden had when he went to Florida yeah. State. And they thought Napier was going to go studs up, rebuild this program quickly. And it turns out, it looks like Napier, he's like, um at this point, he's kind of like, a good horse who jumped up in grade in class and he's having trouble running with the thoroughbred. So I, 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 I basically, I, I agree with what you're saying about the issue with Florida. Well, Mark, right? Here's the problem. Post urban Meyer, they've gone through Will Muschamp, Jim McElwain, Dan Mullen, and now they're uh, uh, with Billy. So that's four coaches in less than what a dozen or so years that that's not a lot of stability. Trust me. Miami went through the same thing where everyone's basically four and done. There's going to come a point in time. That's why it's interesting to me when I hear when Iowa State was getting a little restless with Matt Campbell. I said, are you people crazy? You people <laughs> better think you're lucky stars. That guy is stuck around as long as he did. You, I'm just, I don't know if they could do any better. I think Matt Campbell and Iowa State are actually going to be a very difficult team this year. They were very young last year, and they have a quarterback. And the problem that Florida's going to have is, okay, you fire Billy right now, right? Who's going to be wanting to take that job? Jed Fish is a Florida graduate. Now, I'm a big fan of Jed Fish. I thought he did one of the best rebuilding jobs recently at Arizona. But would he be willing to leave Washington after just one year, even though that's his alma mater? He, he is a Florida student. I don't know if people realize that. Never played football there, but cut his teeth under Steve Spurrier. So let's say he says, no, no, I, I'm, I'm committed to Washington. I got to stick it out here. I'm just telling you. Is it the best thing in the world to be on your fifth coach in less than 15 years? That does not exactly stay. That to me does not reek of relevance or stability. No, it's no way to run a football program, but what it proves is that those 10 or 12 or 18 uh, chieftains around the country who really have the big vision to run a football program at a high level are extremely rare. I mean, the number I, I I got up to 18 there, maybe it's a few more than that, but the really high end coaches are few and far between. And the issue, which you're getting at with turning the thing over every couple of years is you don't get the visionaries. You get the guys who think they're visionaries yeah. and the guys who know how to sell themselves. And I, we're going to see Jed fish was uh fantastic at Arizona. UCLA should have given him a look. That was one of the um, that was mm -hmm. one of the elements they screwed up on. We'll see how Jed Fish does at Washington. But again, if Jed Fish, who just gets to Washington, which is an excellent school program tradition, they have money, they have everything you need to win, basically. If he jumped after one year to go to Florida, you might be once again dealing with a guy who's not ready to settle in and right. build the program from the studs up. So that's the risk you're running when you're turning your program over every few years like that. And, and Florida is stuck in that cycle. I don't know. I'm not, I have not uh, thrown in the towel on Billy Napier yet this year with this schedule and the roster he's built is going to be fascinating from that perspective. Look, it took 
Frank Beamer, seven years to get firm footing at Virginia Tech. I don't know if he'd get seven years nowadays, and that's a shame. I mean, he really became the face of Hokie football, and they were rewarded for it. And, you know, I'll say one thing about Mario. The thing that I like about him is if he hits it big here, he's not going to be Jimmy Johnson. He's not taking off after five years. He's not going to be Dennis Erickson taking off after – he's not going to be Butch Davis – taking just, I think, an irrational decision to take the Browns job. He cost himself a dynasty. If Mario hits it big here, we finally get our version of Joe Pa. We finally get our version of Bo Schembechler, a guy that we can have for 20 years. And we say, okay, that's our guy. Because the way this coaching carousel works now, Mark, and the ripple effect, I mean, think about Washington. Washington, in one moment, is playing for the national title a week later, they lose Kalen DeBoer. That's a punch in the gut because DeBoer can coach. He will do a good job at Alabama. But, I mean, you're really thinking, like, wow, we're going to really build something with DeBoer. Guess what? You got eaten up. And, and it's 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 very unfortunate how it works. Yeah, it is. It's brutal. And the University of Alabama is probably one of two or three, maybe one of one school's that DeBoer would have left Washington yeah. for. And it opened up. <laughs> it opened up. Yeah, there, there certainly are not many of those schools you'd leave Washington for. But, you know, there's the five or six absolutely diamond tier schools that almost any coach would leave for. And unfortunately, Washington got hit with that. But that is a bit of a reality in this area with the, in this era particularly with the Big Ten and SEC and the amount of money they have to spend, is that you can get a coach poached if he's not at the right institution. Right, and that's why if I'm Kansas, I tell Lance Leopold, Lance, I'm going to tell you right now, we will build statues of you. <laughs> Just stick around. I mean, they're building a new stadium. I've been looking at some of the videos. That, that That's going to go down as one of the most impressive rebuilds ever. Lance Leopold should have statues and buildings. There should be national or state holidays uh, in Lawrence, Kansas, because of what him and Jalen Daniels have done. And again, you're fortunate to have him. And, and I give that guy credit for sticking around to see this thing through. I think that's one of the great stories. Now, I'll be watching a lot of Kansas football this year. I, I really think that's a dynamic quarterback they have. Um, but when you have a coach that you really love and respect, you don't know how good your life is. I'm just telling you, Mark, your life is so much better when you have a Terry Donahue at UCLA. You know, when, when I was a kid, I didn't know how good we had it with Jimmy Johnson until he left. So I just, to me, if you're Florida, keep this in mind, you're not guaranteed to get a guy that's going to be immediately better than Billy Napier. Oh, yeah, absolutely true. Um, well, circling back on the field, you know, I look at Miami, this crystal ball team, and I think part of the reason people have the expectations that they have for it is it's built from the lines up. The offensive line and the defensive line are supposed to be not just two of the best in the ACC. The defensive line in particular is supposed to be one of the best in the country. So when you're looking at this game, Miami's O-line, Florida's D-line, Miami's D-line, Florida's O-line, what do you like up front? And where do you see this game going based on who's going to win the line of scrimmage? Mark, I've said this on various spaces and whoever I talk to, it is more important for Mario Cristobal this year to come out fast offensively and to try to actually build leads so that going into the fourth quarter, you turn teams one-dimensional with the throw game. Because the strength of the Miami defense and maybe the whole team is actually its ability to bring real depth and real pass rushes of all shapes and sizes. And that was one of the fundamental principles of a bill walsh game plan bill walsh never actually said i'm going to establish the run he always said i'm going to establish my offense and score points early and then he said in the fourth quarter is when i want to run the ball with the lead with against the fatigue defense and defensively i always want great pass rushers because i know that other team's going to have to throw that that was always his base game plan playing from ahead is how this team can really win big and blow teams out. If, if, if Miami gets on top of Florida by two scores by halftime, I'm just telling you, we could make this life very difficult on Saturday for Graham Mertz because Graham is very good at the quick game. 
quick rhythm. But if now he has to start going in the deeper pass sets and there's no threat of the run, and you are allowing guys like Ruben Bain, um, Alston, and guys of that ilk with defensive line, I think they go about 11 deep. Yeah. You need to be about 10 to play for a national title. That's how the SEC schools have done it. You need to have 10 to 12 guys that could actually play a role. And we have some young freshmen. They probably are not ready to hold up against the run, but if you allow them to just pin their ears back, they could actually play for a series or two. So that's how you play complementary football. But if you're going to play a 20 to 17 game going into the fourth, the, the effectiveness of that defensive line that Miami has, I think will be lessened. But one thing about Mario, you're always going to have great offensive line play with his offensive line coach, Alex Mirabel. And a defensive line, Mario's done an unbelievable job of strengthening the overall front seven. I think Miami has a decided advantage on both sides of the line of scrimmage. And that's not always the case when an ACC team plays an SEC team. Yeah, I would say it's fairly infrequently the case, which is what makes this Miami team potentially so good. And I think why people are so high on it, that pass rush uh, on top of, of all of what you said, that pass rush getting home is also going to be important because I see Miami's defensive backs as probably the weak unit yeah. on the team. What do you see from the back end of their defense? Well, we have a couple of Daryl Porter is going to be drafted. He's not a first round draft choice. He has a chance to make a roster next year though. He was very good in ACC play. Damari Brown is the guy that probably has the most upside. He had a very good freshman year. Um, the safety position is going to be interesting. They have Mish Powell, who played in the national title game for Washington. He's an experienced, steady guy. The loss of Cam Kitchens is interesting. Your Cam would have been very useful this year, although last year he was a little bit of a gambler, and it cost the team here and there. The defensive back crew is probably the lowest-rated unit at Miami, and – yeah. They are going to play a freshman by the name of O.J. Frederick, long limb guy. Reminds me a lot of Michael Rumpf. But keep this in mind. A slightly above average or mediocre secondary can be covered up with a great pass rush. Correct. A great pass rush covers up a lot of things here. Correct. Um, and they're going to have to play a safety by the name of Zaquan Patterson at safety. He was a pretty highly recruited guy. And then Jaden Harris, very athletic free safety. Look, I think the secondary is going to be okay. Is it 2001 <laughs> with Ed Reed and Philip Buchanan? No, but it'll be good enough that if they're allowed to play from ahead, that I don't think they're going to hurt us all that much. Yeah, it's, it's going to come down to the defensive line, in my opinion, getting home. If they can rush Mertz, they're going to, they're going to make yeah. life uh, very difficult for Florida's offense. Florida has pretty good receivers. They have a good tight end. Their offensive line looks pretty good, though. I had to agree with you that I think Miami has a decisive edge with their defensive line. So can they get home? Because Graham Mertz, um, you mentioned it earlier, he's sharp in the short game. He's accurate in the short game. If he can hit three steps or, or a fast five and get the ball out, he's a pretty effective quarterback. I can't recall his exact numbers off the top of my head, but Florida was bottom SEC and bottom tier nationally in terms of downfield passing, completing passes more than 30 and more than 40 yards down the field. They're essentially one of the worst programs in the country going downfield. So as you were saying before, if Miami can put a lead on this game and that D line can get unleashed on Mertz, Florida's going to have a hard time keeping up. So where do you see if Florida is going to hang in this game, how are they going to do it to Miami? Well, they have to win the turnover battle. That's the one thing. You look at a lot of the historical games that Miami has blown against inferior teams, or that's the two Fiesta Bowls or some other ones. When you lose that turnover battle, especially on the road, you are starting to play with fire. And this, look, the home field advantage, I know a lot of people are talking about the swamp and how loud it's going to be. Look, Mark, home field advantage is only as good as that home team. There's never been a bad team that just simply won by being at home. But they have won games when the superior team helps them. And the one thing that people have doubted about Cam Ward, he does turn the ball over when he tries to extend the play and holds the ball a bit too long. Now, he has much better supporting cast up front at Miami, and I would say a better cast of receivers. The way Florida wins this game, 
is to move the ball early and to shorten the game. And so that's going to be a cat and mouse game. If I'm Lance Gidry, our coordinator, I wonder how much press coverage you play knowing that there's some relative inexperience. But keep this in mind. Billy Pearsall is no longer in Gainesville. He's a 49er now. That's probably their best receiver. Eugene Wilson's probably the one guy that really scares Miami the most. But look, you line up athletes and you play. But for Florida, I, I just wonder over four quarters, do they have enough athletes? And here's another thing, Mark. Look at some of the games last year that Florida played down the stretch. That was not a good defense. They gave up over 30 points, like four out of the last five games. So that was not a Will Muschamp type of defense there that they're bringing back. No, the defense totally disintegrated at the end of last season. And uh, Napier did a good job bringing guys in, particularly on the defensive line. They beefed up on the defensive line. They they lost their best player to Ole Miss and, yeah, and Ole Miss's NIL and Lane Kiffin. But uh, Napier had some guys on the team, and then he brought in a lot of size on the defensive line. How much skill is there? How much? Uh, how high the motor drive is there? We're going to find out. But on paper, they did retool the defensive line well. So I do think it's going to be um, an improved defense from last season. Now, I'm looking at the numbers here, the the – the betting lines and the numbers. So I'm going to lay some stuff out and then I want to hear your pick on this game. Um, Miami is two and three straight up in their last five uh, road openers, which is uh, an interesting trend. The last four Florida Miami games have gone under the over under on this game is 53 and a half. The Florida money line is plus plus one fifteen on this game. Florida is a, a, a clear underdog, 115 on the money line. Miami favored by two and a half points on the road. Normally the home field advantage is worth around a field goal to three and a half, sometimes closer to four points. So we're we're working right within that margin. So how's this game going to play out, Steve? Who do you like uh, with the line? Any thoughts on the over under and, and what's your, uh, what are your closing thoughts on what's going to happen at the swamp? Most people seem to be hitting the under that I know of. The other thing is the health of Montreal Johnson. Uh, and we don't know what version we're going to get. I mean, at this time last year, they had ATN and Montreal Johnson. That was a very strong one-two. And Montreal Johnson, I believe, was, is questionable. Again, his health is going to be interesting. Miami actually had a very healthy training camp, is what I've been told. They, they bring in with most of their bullets in the chamber. Look, I think there's going to be an issue with crowd noise. Remember, we have the new headsets now in college football. So communication, I think, will be very interesting in the opening game. But look, after five minutes, it's just another football game. It really is. I've seen a lot of a lot of great atmospheres that it's just all it is is noise at a certain point. The slogan and phrase for this Miami team led by Mario Cristobal that I have is an old line from the late, great George Allen. The future is now. And I know a lot of people are couching it by saying, well, if we lose this game, it's not a conference and we could still go to the playoffs. No, no, no. I believe this is actually a must win. This, In my view, this is Mario Cristobal's biggest regular season game since Ohio State 2021. And I believe this is the biggest game of his professional career. Because if he leads Miami to a big season this year, the next 10 years are set up perfectly. I think he's going to recruit at an incredibly high level. And it's going to be a destination for a lot of people, coaches and players included. And he needs a year like this after last season. There has to be a statement made. I believe Miami is the better team. And I think they're going to cover. I will go 34-17, orange and green. Interesting pick. That's a that's a very decisive road victory. Um, I could see it happening. I could see it being a lot tighter. Fascinating game for all the reasons we've gone over. Yeah. The, the two coaches, the rivalry rekindled. Uh, the implications for the rest of the season. So um, as far as it goes this weekend, and we, we have a great week one slate to open it up, but this is going to be one of the top matchups to watch. So um, appreciate the insight, Steve. Appreciate you joining us and um, let's do it again later in the season. Absolutely, Mark. As always, I enjoy uh, talking with you and let's enjoy a great college football season. All right, Steve, take care of yourself.